The message this morning or today, whatever time you're watching, is entitled, They Thought They Knew God. They thought they knew God. Now, it is a strong possibility that we can worship a God that we created with our opinions of who God really is, therefore rejecting the one true God of the Bible. We know for a fact that there are many interpretations or opinions of God amongst Christians. We, we can go to a different church and we will find a different form of worship, a different God, and they'll yet say they're Christian. Now, I want to look at the Bible today and not just give you my opinion about this topic, they thought they knew God, but I want to look at what the Bible says. Because we're living in an age where there are many interpretations of how to get to heaven, first of all. And Jesus is very clear. There's only one way to heaven. It's through him alone. But not only that, but when we look at the Christian faith worldwide, there are many different types of worship. There are many different types of, of um, songs that they would sing, many customs, many traditions. And therefore, what will creep in will be either the true God that they do worship or a false God that they've set up. And here's what I know. Whether you are a Christian or not, a human being is designed to worship. A human being is designed to, to worship, and a human being is proven throughout time to always form their own God. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 7 through 9, the Bible says, when Jesus is speaking in John chapter 14, he is giving them final instructions before he goes to the cross. At this point in time, he had been with these disciples over three years. They saw so many incredible things that he had done. And look at the statement, the commentary, the comments, the conversation that's going on between Jesus and Philip. Jesus says in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus was telling his disciple, Philip, You've been with me this long. You've heard all the teachings. You've, heard, you've seen all the miracles. You've sang the songs with me. You've been a part of my ministry for three years, and yet you don't know who I am. You don't know who I am. You know, that, that's very uh, similar to, to people in church today. You'll come into church. You can sing the songs. You may know the words in some of the songs, and, and uh, you, you'll know the custom of, of how to come into church and, and all that, and in this church, you come as you are. There's no certain way of getting dressed up when you come, come into this church to visit or to, to worship. You know, we in the ministry, we believe on Sundays in dressing up for, for you all because we consider it an important meeting in our life when we come to serve you in this church. And that's why we wear a suit and tie and dress up because we are honored to have you here. And we want to put our very best forward for you. But there's no requirement to getting dressed up to go to church. But we can get caught up in the, in the, in the routine of things where we, we, we may know God, but then we forget God because we, we are swayed by the opinions of others. You know, there were a lot of people that were following Jesus. It was not just these 12 disciples that were following Jesus. There were a lot of people following Jesus, and there were a lot of opinions going on in Jesus' circle about who Jesus was. And apparently it had crept into one of his disciples, Philip. And Philip is saying in the very last, actually, when this conversation is going on, it is the night before Jesus is arrested and betrayed. 
And Jesus is telling him, haven't you been with me? You've been, you've been with me so long. You've been in church so long, my brother, my sister. Don't you have a real relationship with Christ? Don't you have a real prayer life? Don't you know how to talk? Don't you know how to live by faith? Don't you, have a, don't you experience the love of Jesus and acknowledge it and appreciate the love of Jesus that he gives to you every day? Do you understand that? The, sh the showering of love, of grace, of peace, of joy that he puts upon you. Things that we don't deserve. He loves us. Church, sometimes we neglect these things. Sometimes we take these things and then for granted and then we take each other for granted. Now, I'm going to read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32. Now, it's going to be a very long read, but I want to read it straight through because I want to allow you to understand because when Paul wrote the book of Romans in chapter 1, he opened up with the unrighteousness of men. He was speaking to the church in Rome. Rome was the epicenter of the world at that time. Every religion passed through Rome. And so there was every kind of wickedness going on in Rome. The Christianity was being introduced in Paul's day to Rome. Paul had a desire to go to Rome with the gospel. And so when he opens up in chapter 1 to the church in Rome, it's very hard, the words that he's given, because he knows that he's speaking to a people who have worshipped all kinds of gods. So just listen to this. In Romans 1, 18 through 32, he says here at the very beginning of this letter, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, God, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, people, are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their, foolishness, their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Remember the Egyptians? They began to worship things like this. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, they worshiped creation, the moon, the sun. Verse 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do they do the same, but also approve of those who practice these things or them. Paul is saying in this scripture that God showed himself from the very beginning 
through creation. You think about Adam and Eve. Adam saw all the animals. Adam himself knew that he was a creation of God. And from the very beginning, men knew that there was a creator in heaven because they saw creation. They saw life. They saw the complexity of life. They were not cavemen, okay? They were not who, 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 coming from a monkey, a frog. God created man perfect. But when sin came into the world, we became imperfect and we became susceptible, able to die, our bodies decaying daily. And now the journey um, for Jesus from his throne was to begin to come to earth. And God worked through uh, Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and King David and, and Joseph the carpenter all the way to Joseph and Mary. God worked through those people, imperfect people, to bring in the Messiah. But through all that time, they knew who God was because they could look at creation. The Egyptians, in their day, they would rather worship the sun, the moon, the stars, rather than God of heaven and earth. And that carried over. Look, that still even happens today. Now, I'm not getting religious here, but what I am saying is people are very easily able to worship a God that they've made up in their mind of opinions of who they think God is, and it's not really the God of the Bible. Do you know in the Old Testament, Leviticus says, do not mark your bodies for the, for, for, you know, do not mark your bodies. Because it was a custom in the old days that you would mark your bodies for the remembrance of those who had died. And there was a reason why in the Old Testament they would say that, because you were shedding blood. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood. Blood, the atonement of Jesus' blood was needed to bring the forgiveness of sin. Now, when Adam sinned, God, he had an animal put to death to cover them with animal skins. See, because when Adam found out that he was naked, he went and got some fig leaves and covered himself. And God said, that's not going to work, Adam. Yes, you may think you were covering yourself, but what is really needing to be covered is your sin, and that requires blood. So watch where I'm going with this. Blood is always, the life is in the blood. That's what the Bible says. And so when the wicked in the Old Testament times were, were, were putting tattoos on their body, it was for the shedding of blood because they were remembering somebody because they were putting something important on their body to either identify who they were as well. And this was not right because it required the shedding of blood. And the shedding of blood is very important. Now, there are a lot of people in the church today that go and get them Christian tattoos. But you see, they do this because they, they have an opinion that in their mind it's okay. When in actuality, if you really see how it's tied to Old Testament and what, what really God believes about the blood, then, then you would know that, wow, the word of God is not for these things. That's just an example, my friend, of how we can make our opinions up of, oh, it's okay to do this. God will forgive me. It's okay. And we, we, we enter into the church today thinking it's okay to just live with somebody before you marry them. It's okay to, to live in immorality for a brief moment, and it's not okay. It's, it's actually worthy of death, and if you were to die in that situation, I mean, my, my, my friend, is, is it worth your soul? Is it worth destroying the lives of others? We may think we know God, but in actuality, we have a form of God that we're making up for ourselves. In Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13, I want to look at the parable of the ten virgins. Because these individuals, let's read it, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, Jesus is telling this parable, this story. It's a parable, an illustration of, to understand what the kingdom of heaven is like. 
Jesus is saying basically that these virgins symbolize Christians, believers. Because you see, as a Christian, we are to be innocent in the eyes of God. Amen? Because the blood of Jesus has washed us of our sin, so we are innocent in the eyes of God. Amen? We're pure again. We are pure. That's what uh, these virgins stand for. The bridegroom is Christ. Jesus is coming back for his church. In Jewish customs in the day, when a man was going to marry a woman, he would come to the lady and say, I'm going to marry you, but I'm going back to my father's house to prepare our home, and I will come to you unannounced, and I will take you to be my wife, and there will be a wedding feast in Jewish custom tradition. It lasted seven days. Do you know I just, I just gave you an illustration of what Jesus has done with the church? Jesus has told the church, I will come back. I'm going away to my father's house. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says, You believe in God, believe in also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I will come back for you. He tells the church that. We hear about the wedding feast in the book of Revelation. When, Christ, when we will be in, in heaven, while the earth goes through a seven-year period, the Jewish custom wedding was seven days. A day is like a, a thousand years to God. A thousand years to us are like a day to God. So time is different from heaven to the things on earth. And so we see the, com the similarities of what we're going through, of what we're about to go through. And so Jesus is given this story about him coming back for the church. And in verse 2, he says, Now five of these virgins were wise, and five were foolish. Half the church is wise, half the church is foolish. They were all believers, and they all thought they knew God. Verse 3, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We know that for a fact. But the wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. This lamp, it's sort of like your, your mind, body, and soul. That's what it makes up. It's your whole being. And for the Christian who is wise, they are daily filled with this oil, the Holy Spirit. They have a real bona fide relationship with Christ. They talk to him. They love him because they experience and recognize his love daily upon their life from him. So their, their lamps are being full of oil. It's life. It's the Holy Spirit in us. But these other five were foolish. They were able to hold the things of God, the, the Holy Spirit, but they neglected it. They thought they knew God but they did not see the, the importance and the necessity to be filled with this oil, with the Holy Spirit, as they waited for the bridegroom, for Jesus to come. Verse 5, But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now, basically, Jesus is saying that they all became weary. I do not care if you are a super Christian. You will at one point become tired and weary and want to give up. Raise your hand if you felt like giving up as a Christian. Is this really worth it? Jesus, I'm so tired. Jesus, I just want to die. Jesus, do you really exist? Do you really hear me, Jesus? Look at that, verse 5. While the bridegroom was delayed, Jesus, when are you coming back? Jesus, do you care? Do you care about the injustice that's happening in this world throughout the years? Verse 6, and at midnight, when we're all asleep, tucked in our beds, when we all thinking that it's not going to happen, Christ comes back. At midnight, a cry was heard, a cry. I think about what kind of cry was that? It says, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Now, this is so important to understand at verse 6. There is an angelic voice that is crying in the hearts of believers, and he is giving us a warning that Jesus is coming. Not that Jesus has come. There's a difference between he's coming and he's come. He's here. There's a difference. There is a difference. And every spirit-filled believer knows this. They hear that cry today because they know God. And they know that in their heart they must be ready. 
They must be prepared. They must guard their prayer life. They must guard their life of when the Lord would lead them into a time of fasting over certain things. They must guard their Christian fellowship. They must guard their time alone in the studying of Scripture, applying and believing and just having a good life in Christ. They must guard this life. They must guard their mind. They must guard their hearts. They must, they must, through the power of the Spirit, all of this, they must protect those who they love. And that's everyone, because we're called to love all. We're on guard. We may get a little sleepy, but we know Christ is coming. We know, because this is the cry. And verse 7, when that cry does come out, and I believe, look, look at verse 7, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. You know why all of them, the other foolish five, rose up? Now, this is my opinion. Because when the foolish saw the wise moving, it got their attention too. There's a stirring in the church, and it's catching the attention of the foolish in Christ, sadly, as well as unbelievers. Because when God stirs, everyone knows it. So they all got up. Verse 8, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Meaning the wise, went, the, the foolish went to the wise, and they, they thought that those people, you know, I've told my kids as they're growing up, you're not going to get into heaven because your mom and daddy serve in the church as ministers. And they know that. They understand it. And they have their own relationship with Christ. Praise God. But you, you get what my point, what I'm trying to say. You're not going to get into heaven because of someone else's relationship with Jesus. You have to have your own relationship. Not your spouse. Not your family. You personally, you have to have your own relationship with Jesus, period. Because when you stand before God, it's just you and him. Nobody else. But I've been married 80 years. It don't matter. God is the ancient of days. When God created you, he didn't see your spouse in the womb when, with your mama in you, there in your mama. He didn't see all that together. He saw you. You are individual. You're unique. No one in the world is like you. Amazing. Verse 9. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And you see, how can you buy the Holy Spirit? Is that what they were really saying? I'm reminded in the book of Acts when Simon the sorcerer, he sees the apostles laying their hands on people and they're receiving the Spirit. They're getting filled. And Simon offered money and said, give me this power too so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Spirit. And Peter said, you are wicked. You are wicked. Now, now watch me. I'm follow, follow me, please. You Repent of your sin. Repent of your sin, Simon. It's wrong what you just asked. I'm paraphrasing. These, the, these wise, they look at these foolish, and it's like, go buy some yourself. It, it's hopeless. They have a debased mind. What we read in the book of Romans, God gave them over to a debased mind. You know what that means? It's a reprobate mind, meaning a mind that can never come back to God. It's, your mind is as seared as with a hot iron. You get a nice white piece of cloth, you pour wine and ketchup on it, and you get a hot iron, let it dry, and you sear it in. That stain will never come off. There are people, and only God knows those people, there are people in this world today who are like that. They will never, ever come to God. They will think they have a relationship with God. They thought they knew God. They did the Christian thing. But God knew in their hearts that they were wicked. Because look at these five foolish. They were able to be filled with the Spirit. And they, come out, they counted themselves among the group of the wise. And the wise are not even wasting time talking to them. You know what? Just go buy some. Knowing you can't buy this. You can't buy this. Sometimes there's no sense in talking to people because th th they're not going to hear you. But that's only for God to know. But my point in what I'm making is they go. They go. Look, look at verse 10. And while they went out to buy, 
they thought they could buy their relationship with God. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, Jesus came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I said to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's where we find ourselves today, my friend. We find ourselves today. We find ourselves today where we think we know God, but we don't know God. We think we have a relationship with God, but it's a form of religion. It's not a loving relationship with Christ. Look, when you are bound in your sin, bound in your unbelief, and Jesus set you free, and he can set you free. Amen? When he can set you free, you don't forget that. As a Christian, you may stumble, you may fall, but you get back up and you go forward and you progress in your relationship with Christ. You continue to learn and grow and eventually you begin to leave defeat and discover more and more victory in your life. And what I mean by that is by you're not falling into temptations of sin. That's what I mean. You're overcoming sin because when you're born into this world, you will automatically have the sin nature within you. Well, we talked about that last week, remember? You do not have to teach a child to be stingy or to lie. They naturally know how to do that because we have the sin nature in us. But as a Christian, we have two, the, the sin nature, but we have the Holy Spirit. And whatever we feed will win. As a Christian, we feed ourselves because it's through the Holy Spirit. But this is so important to hear. Let me read this one more parable here in Luke 14 verse 15 through 24 they would always ask Jesus questions about the kingdom of heaven and Jesus gives them another he says in verse Luke 14 15 he says now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things he said to Jesus blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God you know they were sitting down eating having a good time and and Jesus was talking to them about heaven and, and, and they're like, praise God about the kingdom of God. You know, we're, we're having a good meal with Jesus right now. I just can't imagine how it's going to be when we get to heaven, Jesus. So blessed Jesus are those who are going to go to heaven with you. That's basically what was going on in the conversation. And look at what Jesus says in verse 16. <laughs> he don't just say, amen, brother. He don't say that. <laughs> Instead, he says the opposite. Jesus says in verse 16, then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper this is God he's talking about and invited many and he sent his servant that's symbolic of Jesus and the church he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited come for all things are ready now and isn't that what we say in the church now come what does Jesus say come to me all who are heavy burdened and, and weighted down with the burdens of life and sin come to me says Jesus I will give you rest isn't that what we say in the church come to Jesus come come as you are amen am I talking to an alive people today talk to me you are a preacher as well amen hallelujah isn't that what we say in the church so that's the message that that that, that this man gave to his servant servants God is saying it's prepared. This dinner, this feast, all, you know, I created, God is basically saying he created heaven in six days. But look at how long it's taken to create a new heaven and a new earth. My goodness, people will miss heaven because they were focused on a temporary world. Living in spiritual and physical poverty, that's not God's plan for you. But some of us are going to go through physical poverty, not because you don't have a good job, but because you may, because that's just because you live in certain parts of the world where it's poor. But that's not God's plan. It was never God's plan that we would, that we would suffer from the heat, from the dust of the earth, that we would suffer from starvation sometimes. That was never God's plan. But God works through all of that. And he's preparing a place for those who love him. So don't miss this relationship with Christ. 
It's a place where sin does not exist. And if we are going to a place where sin does not exist, then Christian, get the sin out of your life. Get the sin out of your life. Well, Michael, uh, we're never going to be perfect. What, what, what does the scripture say? Let us cast off the weight that so easily entangles us. That's New Testament, guys. But as a Christian, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to be done with bad attitudes, bad characteristics, sin. We are done. We are able to cast that off and be done with it. Now, in verse 16... Let me read this. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come for all, things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. There are three, three examples of, of people. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The world is in one accord right now towards God. That's what Pastor Eric was just talking about a little while ago. One said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. And I ask you to have me excused. See, some people's reason for not making it to heaven is because they're focused on the things of the world. They're busy with the land they bought. They're busy with the things they're building. They're busy with the, with the restoration of that 55 Chevy. They're busy trying to reach that general manager's position. And they don't have time for Jesus. If they don't have time for Jesus on Sunday morning, they're not going to have time for Jesus for eternity. <laughs> Amen. Well, Michael, you just don't know how many hours I worked this week. And I worked all day Saturday. I'm just tired. Heaven? No one ever said heaven was going to be easy. No one ever said the Christian life was going to be easy. What did God tell Adam? Now, Adam, because of sin, you're going to have to work this ground by your blood, sweat, and tears. And woman, you are going to bring children into this world by much pain. Hey, women say amen. amen. Uh, was it great pain? Let me hear it. Amen. 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 Carol Burnett once said, uh, childbirth is like the, 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 the experience, the pain of childbirth. It's like pulling your lip, uh, uh, up, lower lip, and pull it over your head. That's the, to experience childbirth. And I'm like, and Bill, oh, Brother Bill, yesterday, didn't you tell me? He, he probably forgot. He says, man, it's so good being a man, being a guy. <laughs> and I was thinking about that. Good timing, good timing. He said, man, it's, I just love being a guy. Man, we don't, you know, yeah, you remember now, right? We're talking about some other stuff, but we're out there working on that hot roof up there. The sun's just blasting down on us, but we just, we just love being guys. Yeah, we do. Amen. And it's not easy being a woman. It's not easy being a woman. Oh, no, it's not. Amen. Amen. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. And I ask you to have me excused. The second individual saw what the first individual said. And he goes, oh, oh, I don't have that good of an excuse. Uh, oh, and all, oh, oh, my, my animals. So it was very similar to this first guy's excuse. Well, well I can't give uh, of my time, talent, and treasure. Or I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't go to this function because, you know, you know why you can't do all these things? Because you don't have a real relationship with Jesus. You know why you're not a good faithful steward? Be because you don't know God. You really don't. You're approaching God by form of re religion and not a true relationship. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He had a relationship with the world. It was personal to him. And he wanted to save what was lost. And so he gave. And why do we give Christian of our time, talent, and treasure? Because it's real to us. We understand the purpose of why we give of our mind, body, and soul. Loving the Lord our God with all our mind, body, and soul. All of that. Because we know that it meets a purpose. Amen? Amen. But look at verse 20, this third individual. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now this guy had a good excuse, if there was ever to be an excuse. 
Because when you get married, well, what does Paul say in the New Testament? Paul, the single apostle, he says, it is better to stay single. But if you must marry, go ahead. Because you don't want to burn with lust of passion. Amen? 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 But it is better to stay single, said Paul. Now, this is not a command, he said. But it's still no excuse to miss heaven, to miss your relationship with Christ, and to miss your relationship with the church. Because, look, you know, Christian, what brings encouragement to your life every day? There are two things that bring encouragement to your life. And, if, and I'm going to tell you right now what they are. You know what it is? It's your relationship with Jesus. And also, it's your relationship with your local church. Those are the only two things that can bring encouragement to you. Well, pastor, my church don't bring me no encouragement. Well, maybe you're not at the right church. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect pastor. But you'll know if God has brought you to a Bible-believing church, a loving church. Those are the only two places. He Hebrews 10, 25. You know, as a matter of fact, I want to read it because people say, no, you don't need to go to church to have uh, joy. Well, let me read this to you in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, verse 24 and 25. It says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is some, as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, what does that mean? That word exhorting, when you look at it in the dictionary, it means to strongly encourage. That's the definition of exhorting, to strongly encourage. So in, it's saying, don't be like others who, who have the habit of missing our gatherings. You go because you know you're stirring up good works and love and the life of others. You're exhorting one another, meaning you're bringing great encouragement as you see the day approaching. Verse 25, as you see the day approaching. What is that day? It's capital D in the, in the Bible, meaning it could be the day of your death or it could be the day of the rapture of the church. It is a very important day as you come to the end of your life on earth. That's what we are called to do. The church fellowship brings encouragement and your relationship with Jesus brings encouragement. So we, do we agree now? Amen? Don't neglect prayer meetings. Do not neglect our Bible studies. Do not neglect when we go out as a church to do things. You know why? Because that's where you're going to get the encouragement. That's where you grow. That's where you... Because look, I have two sisters... They are my sisters because of the blood of a man. My father, who's sitting in the back. And I love my sisters forever. But when I became a Christian, the Bible says that I was adopted into the family of God because of the blood of another man, Jesus. And I have inherited a multitude of brothers and sisters. So though I ought to never neglect my brothers, my sisters because of the blood of my father, because if I do, I'm, a, I'm worse than a heathen. But I am also to understand that I have an obligation now also to my brethren in the church of Jesus Christ. That's a concept that's not understood in church today. Jesus says, the world will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Meaning, when we show the love we have for other brothers and sisters in Christ, then we prove that we really have love in our hearts. Church fellowship. Supporting your home church in your time, talent, and treasure because we all have a work to do and we get it done only together because we know God. 
But those who don't know God cannot understand this. So let me finish this. He had a wife, and he said, I cannot come. There's no, there's no excuse. Because look at what happens in verse 21. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. That's the Lord going back to the father. Then the master of his house, being angry, and it's not wrong to get angry. Jesus got angry, amen? Overturned the money changer's table, remember that? In the temple, he had a righteous anger. There is an anger that does not lead to sin. It's a righteous anger. And this is what this master had a righteous anger. And he said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. God is saying, everybody's welcome to come in. You see, the servant first went out to the nation of Israel and the Jews rejected him. And then God says, everybody, bring all those Gentiles in. Bring them all in. And that's why Jesus said in John, in, 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 uh, John 15, where Jesus says, I have other sheep who are not of this pen. He was talking to Israel, but he tells them, I have other sheep who are not of your pen. He was talking about you and me. Because I only have 1% European Jewish. Anna has 2% European Jewish, right? Because somewhere down the line, blood's got all mixed up. But some of us don't have any Jewish in us. So he was talking about the Gentiles, those who had no lineage to Jesus through the Jewish blood. God loved them all. God says, I'm bringing them all in. And that's what the master said here. Well, you go back out. You go into the ugly places of the earth because there's a beautiful place, right? Look at the Colorado Mount Rockies. Oh, man, who would not want to live up there? Look at that Alaskan frontier. Live in Alaska. Amen. Beautiful. Or you want to live in the slums of Ethiopia and, and, and the hot deserts of Africa. God said, go and tell everybody. Tell them all that I have prepared a great feast because not all of them know. But the ones who thought they knew did not know God. They thought they knew God. Do not let this be you. This is a warning, my friend. Do not be caught amongst that group that thought they knew God. But I have a Bible. Look, my name is even on it. <laughs> the devil quoted scripture to Jesus, and we know his outcome. They thought they knew God. Well, Michael, why didn't you just tell me this from the beginning? Because sometimes we have to hear with Scripture, and we got to go into detail to really understand a, a, a message. And this is what is happening in the church today. So many opinions. Look, stop listening to the preachers on TV and radio. There's some good ones, but there's a lot of them that are not biblical. But God gave you a mind, a body, and a soul to seek Him for yourself. You know how to read. You know how to pray. Talk to him. Study. Show yourself an approved worker of Christ. Study the scriptures. They'll bring discipline into your life. They'll bring accountability in your life. And keep yourself in the fellowship of the church. Because what does scripture say? One strand rope can easily be broken. Two, not as easily. Three strands will not be broken. Now, I may come into something horrible in my life, but because I have a couple of faithful brothers in my life, I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to be broken. I may stumble. I may trip. But because I've, I've, I was helped back up, because I was strengthened by fellowship, I can keep going forward. And if you neglect that in your life, if you're neglecting church fellowship, you're neglecting Jesus Christ too. Because Jesus is found in the church. Now, if you know God, you'll know that what I just said is true. And so receive this word with joy in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give God praise in this house.